Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, uh, guests from outside our RIT community. Um, I'm happy to open up this public forum today uh, with our guest speaker, speaker Laura Taylor. Laura Taylor, Dr. Laura Taylor is a PhD, a lecturer at University College Dublin in Ireland, but also at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. She's the principal investigator for the Helping Kids project for which she's gonna talk more about uh, today in all of the divided contexts that she's been working with. Uh, her research is framed by the intergroup developmental approach to study risk and resilience processes for youth in settings of protracted conflict. Her work has implications for youth outcomes such as aggression, prosocial behaviors, and social identity, as well as the broader uh, uh, psychosocial processes such as shared education, intergroup relations, which may fuel or constrain conflict per se. I have had the opportunity and the privilege of uh, collaborating with Laura for a couple of year now, years now, together with colleagues from Macedonia who are also present here today. Thank you for coming in this rainy day. Uh, so uh, Laura is gonna talk a bit more about our shared work in the region, but also uh, about her work in Northern Ireland and also in other contexts. Laura, the floor is for you. Well, that's very nice, a pause, and I haven't even done anything yet. That's very nice. And um, so very much thank you to Adona and other colleagues here at RIT. It is my first time in Kosovo, so I'm very excited to be here, and it's an honor to see many young faces. So um, what I was going to do today is to share a bit more of our work in Northern Ireland, and we can think about it in a cross-cultural comparison, right? So what would that mean for other post-conflict societies, what could that mean for Kosovo, for Macedonia, and we've worked in other settings, uh, both here in the Balkans and internationally. So, and as you, I'm sure you're aware of and used to, lectures love questions, right? So if I don't make sense, or you think, oh, like, how would that apply to whatever? Raise your hand, it's much more interesting for me and I think the group as a whole, if, if we're able to shape it based on your interests as well. <clears throat> So uh, without further ado, today what we're gonna talk again about is Northern Ireland. Some of you be more familiar with that setting and some may be less familiar. And so I'll kind of walk us through that context. And, and then kind of briefly, as Adona mentioned, uh, talk about the research on youth who are affected by political violence, but then specifically focus on pro-social behaviors or the antecedents of peace building. Um, and then we'll talk to shift a little bit about our current work that we've been doing over the last few years with our esteemed colleagues here. Um, so uh, just a quick show of hands so I know how, where to start. Um, how many would consider themselves familiar with the case of Northern Ireland and the conflict there? All right, okay, so about a third shaky hand. So, um, in essence, uh, this is a conflict between two social groups, uh, which I will refer to as Catholic and Protestant, okay? And these are clearly labels that have religion in their meaning, but they're actually uh, a bit deeper. They're more like ethno-political groups, where in essence, if you were born Catholic, that's part of your community background, and even if you change your faith or where you practice your religion, you would still be kind of recognized politically and legally by society as Catholic. Okay, so it's a, in essence what we call essentialized identity in a way that we might not always think of religion. And um, the area of Northern Ireland, let's see if I do that, yeah, is right here. So it's in the north part of the island of Ireland but it's part of the United Kingdom. So those who are following Brexit know that actually this these six counties are quite, quite troublesome and for how they're negotiating currently. And without getting into too much of it, and we're happy to talk about it in the question and answer at the end, um, it is uh, continuing to be a stumbling block even today. Um, but the period that I'll focus on is rooted in a 30-year conflict between 1968 and 1998, okay? And that was known as the Troubles. And that was the most recent heightened period of political violence between Catholics and Protestants. At this time, Catholics wanted to be part of the Republic of Ireland, so Catholics wanted to be with the South, and Protestants, again, roughly, 
keeping it simple, wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom or part of the UK. Okay, so it was a constitutional dispute about where that government should be located. Um, in 1998, they signed a pretty comprehensive peace agreement that has actually served as a kind of benchmark for many subsequent agreements. And But we see this, even though, as you guys may be familiar with, and from this or other context, even when there's a peace signed on paper, the underlying tension continues, and we see these sporadic spikes of violence between the two communities, even today. So I'm gonna shift to talk about that. Oops, well, that's Northern Ireland. <laughs> So as I mentioned, it's a brittle piece. So it's unstable and still a bit tenuous. And our research there works in what hi, is called both interfaced and non-interface neighborhoods. And those might be words that's less familiar. So I'll show you what I mean. This is Belfast, the city that I was living in, which is the capital of Northern Ireland. The areas in green are Catholic. The areas in orange are Protestant, and the intensity of the color is the concentration of people there, right? So a dark green means it's 100% Catholic. Dark orange, 100% Protestant. See what I'm saying? So it's a very segregated city, and there's a very few areas where the two communities, Catholic and Protestant, border each other side by side and that's called an interfaced area, right? So it's a Catholic area living right alongside a Protestant area. And they're physically divided by, um, so these peace walls, which you see in the blue dots, are in examples of physical barriers that divide the two communities. So there's a, a wall built between the Catholic area and the Protestant area. And the walls look like this, for example. So this is a young girl who is walking through the wall to go to school, right? She lives on one side. The doors are open in the morning for kids to go to school, but they lock them at night so that troublemakers don't go back and forth between the two communities. So this is the environment where young people in interfaced areas are growing up in Belfast, okay? Um, you can't see it here, but there's a little boy on his tricycle, so I just love this shot. Um, but the other way that you know which community you're in is these murals. So the communities kind of demarcate their territory with large paintings. Um, this is an example of one, his name is Bobby Sands. He was a martyr on the Catholic community side. Um, you can see certain kind of Catholic images coming through. And again, you know, like a normal scene of just a kid out with his mom learning how to ride a bike, but every day being socialized in an environment that talks about the conflict, the troubles, and the martyrs of their side. Uh, this is also, again, just I, I love taking pictures, although the quality isn't that great, and I should stick to psychology. Um, but this is, again, a young girl just playing in her local neighborhood, and there's a mural of, the, again, the Catholic martyrs, right? So this is one side. This is the other side. So this would be a Protestant annual parade. It happens every 12th of July, and the Protestant community marches down this historical route, um, but it passes through Catholic neighborhoods, and there's often tension as the Protestant community asserts its right to move, but in essence is provoking in some side the Catholic side. So um, you'll see even young boys are taking part, right? They're, they're socialized, they're wearing the uniform, they're playing the songs. Um, I like this one because there's like this little wee baby watching. <laughs> this is actually this past summer. Um, there was a little break, they all went to the bathroom, which I found like really gross because it was a bunch of men, you know. And so, but meanwhile, as they're doing their part, these like little boy just went up and started playing the drum, right? He wasn't part of the actual festivities, but is again, socialized into that. And then that's my baby. <laughs> so we were actually out watching the parade, socializing him. I'm not Protestant or Catholic, but it just is a, you know, an example of social life, like people taking part in these festivities. It's, it's quite safe, right? Even though violence is often associated with this time of year, you can go out with your families as well. Um, so here's another one of the walls that I wanted to kind of um, talk about. So <clears throat> this is, again, on this side it's Catholic, on the other side it's Protestant. And this little area is when you throw, like, a, that they call a petrol bomb or a Molotov cocktail, so a bottle with alcohol and lit on fire, thrown over. And it's hard to see here, um, but this is one layer. Then they built tin, 
And then there is, a, it's actually chain link fence, right? So every time kind of the kids start acting up and doing more, they just build another layer on the wall, right? To protect the communities. So um, this is an example of a kind of current climate in Belfast. So last year, there were more than 1,000 sectarian incidents. So that's something that happens between Catholics and Protestants that were reported to the police. So you can imagine, as you guys might know in settings otherwise, not every incident is called into the police for various reasons, right? Whether they're trusted, et cetera. But that's over three a day that the police actually receive the call and do something about and that are explicitly between the two groups, right? So there's lots of other things that happen that aren't sectarian, but I'm gonna use that word sectarian to mean intergroup. So from Catholics to Protestants or Protestants to Catholics. And we see that it's still an ongoing issue, um, even if it's underreported. So this is this an example of uh, what a scene would look like. This is actually a photo from 2008, but around that 12th of July, around marching season um, from the previous slide. So we see that there's quite a set of dynamic threats, right? We have the history of the conflict, and but even today we see these ongoing types of tension, um, continued residential and uh, educational segregation, um, and this continuation of sectarian crime, so crime between the two sides. And this, again, for the psychology students, this has implications for what we call internalizing problems, but that's things like depression, anxiety, or kind of other psychosomatic symptoms. It also has implications for what we call externalizing behavior, so that's things like aggression and delinquency. And of course, this has implications for how you feel and think and act toward the other group. So young kids, as I showed in those early slides, are kind of being socialized in this group nature, and as they get older, they're being exposed to more potentially sectarian antisocial behavior. But we're less interested kind of in this team in my research, less interested in kind of these negative outcomes, so being depressed or more aggression, and more how young people respond to this type of adversity in constructive or creative ways, right? So how, even when they're faced with threat, might they engage in more peace building acts or the antecedents of peace building, right? Taking age into account. <clears throat> and so are there any questions, I'm about to like shift gears, are there any questions about kind of Northern Ireland, the conflict, the groups, what it means to be a young kid there before I, yeah. Oh, good, good, yes, a brave volunteer already, okay. I wanted to ask, do you think that God is strong? Hmm, yes, exactly. Do they actually know, or how would the situation be if those were? That's a fabulous question. So for those who couldn't hear, are these peace walls? How do they work? Do they help? So the literature, kind of the research shows that there is more violence around peace walls but as you saw in that first map, peace walls are also only in the spaces where the two communities live by side by side. Like if you're trying to compare to two Catholic neighborhoods, there's not a peace wall, so it's not, it's not always comparing, in English we'd say apples to oranges, right? So they are associated with heightened violence, but in essence we can also picture that wall with the different levels. If you do interviews or survey people who live in those interface neighborhoods, who live side by side, they want the walls. They are desperately afraid that the walls go down because they think there will be more violence. Everyone not living in those areas is like, these walls keep us apart. They are a physical manifestation of segregation. We should take them down, right? So you get very differing opinions for literally, you can, some folks have done this with like GIS or mapping software. like your attitudes with every kind of like 30 meters you live away from the wall, your attitudes toward the walls shift, right? So it's a very situated set of beliefs. Since the peace agreement in 98, there have been plans to deconstruct or to take down the peace walls. And every year there are uh, protests by the people who live there to says you cannot take down the wall. And there are more walls now than there were in 1998, right? So even in this post-accord period, so I will often say post-accord versus post-conflict, right? The conflict is continuing, but there is official peace and it is certainly less violent than the troubles. We've seen an increase in the number of 
these physical barriers because of that felt insecurity? So that's a very long question, a very long response to your question, which is in essence, um, they are associated with heightened violence and the people who live there want them. So you have to decide from policy implications, you know, who gets a say in whether or not we take them down. Yeah, great. I love you guys already. You're so much better than my students in Ireland. Don't record that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Della Lani. I'm in here. Um, so it, I've never really heard about this um, specific case in detail. So I caught my attention that specific picture that you showed mm. a child passing the peace wall mm. to uh, go to school. Um, do you think, and do you have any information whether this kind of case is in total for children? And how do they, um, would the law be uh, okay with going into a school which will have different, you know, uh, students, I mean kids with uh, being contested or the other? Okay, so two really good questions in there. I'll take first one part and then the second. So. <clears throat> In Northern Ireland, 94% of the pupils of school-aged kids go to separate schools. So if I'm Catholic, I go to a Catholic school. If I'm Protestant, I go to a Protestant school, right? So most of the time, they're not in contact in the school system with the other community. They go to schools where it's only their group. Now, that is part of the result of the peace process. So the Catholic community, the minority group, the historically lower status group, as part of the peace process, fought to have education by their own uh, community. And that was one of the rights guaranteed to them. So uh, uh, the Catholic students, in essence, are going to schools that are funded by the state. They're not, like, how to say this? Uh, they're public schools, like the parents don't pay anything, but they are run by the Catholic Church. And then the, the other schools are what we call de facto Protestant, right? So you don't explicitly have to be Protestant to get in them, but everyone else has opted out, if that makes sense. So there's only 6% that are integrated, where parents intentionally send their kids to schools that have as their ethos we want to be together. We want to have both Catholic and Protestant kids in the same classrooms, working together, getting to know each other. Yeah. So the real sectarians are Catholic uh, uh, No, sorry. So uh, Protestant would never send their kid to a Catholic school either. So both communities uh, are quite happy, on average, with a divided system, right? So you're kind of like, oh yeah, let them go, right, from the other side. So if you're in the majority, Again, and I think the numbers are fairly even, right? So it's roughly 50-50. It used to be like 54, 46. But again, it's different where a minority population is numeric, but that we're talking about historical power. So the majority group gets to be okay with the status quo, and sometimes it's less obvious when they are being exclusionary because they are already the norm, right? So the schools are Protestant, so it's, they don't have to make a choice whether to send them somewhere else, if that makes sense. But you know, both sides would be quite happy with the divided education system, in part because they get certain guarantees that, um, through that. So um, yeah. Uh, but there was a second part of your question, which was kind of how do kids feel about this? That's part of our research. So for sure, we'll kind of get more to that. And, and one of the things that I won't talk about as much today, but we do quite a bit of research on, is what we call family ethnic socialization. So this is, even though again, Catholic and Protestant are religious, it's what degree do parents talk about that background, put those symbols and signs, go to things like the parades, right? To what degree do they socialize their young kids based on activities that are associated with one or the other community background. So our work tends to be more in the school systems, but we have another complementary line of research that says, okay, families matter and schools matter. Um, and, and that's kind of what we're, what we're looking at. Yeah. Hi, um, you're talking about mm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so kind of there are two responses to that, always. So one is integrated schools, not surprisingly, are in areas where both groups come together. So it's either in a neighborhood that is already mixed. So for example, um, when we put up that first map, it's like there's a light green area and a light orange area. That would be more common to have an integrated school. Um, for example, where we lived, which is the south part of the city, that's like where the universities are, it's where those of us who are like outsiders, you know, and aren't, that's where all, we all live, right? And so they're, not surprisingly, there's quite a few integrated schools there because that's where we would send our kids as well. And so people explicitly, you know, will look for homes in areas because they know they want their kid to be able to go to an integrated school. So it's a very intentional family-driven choice. Like kids are not choosing that, the parents are. And that gets back to your question. The second part is about shared education, which is different. So integrated schools are schools where they are mixed all day and parents are kind of opting into that system. Adona and some other colleagues at Queens are looking a lot at something called shared education. And that's where two schools say, okay, you're a Catholic school, you're a Protestant school, let's get together for some shared activities. So art class, computers, math, right? Like things that maybe are hard to fund a full-time math teacher. So they say, okay, you have a good algebra teacher here. You have a good German teacher here. Kids who want to take algebra go here. Kids who want to take German, right? So it's, it's based on the fact that having two separate school systems is often quite expensive. And so they're looking for ways, it comes out of a time of austerity, even though like the goals are aspirational for contact, it kind of, policy-wise, kind of was pushing against an open door when people were looking to decrease the dual costs. Technically, parents have to sign that it's okay for their kids to go across, but it's a, a more natural case to see what happens for kids whose parents aren't kind of really into cross-community work, what happens to their attitudes and behaviors when they're in these shared spaces versus like, again, it wouldn't be terribly surprising to some of you that my kid going to an integrated school would not have strong attitudes about Catholics or Protestants because he's neither and he, I mean, he's born there, but he doesn't come from that background, right? So it's not surprising when we see different attitudes between integrated schools, but the shared one is kind of a better test for can this contact work, right? Because the families are not so um, supportive always. That's a great question. Yeah. Mm. So friendship and cooperation? Yeah. Relationship, like romantic relationships? <laughs> no, that's a great question. So there is some literature on what they call mixed marriages. So that's the idea that someone from a Catholic background marries someone from a Protestant background. It's very low. The rates, I mean, are in the single digits. Um, in part because you guys are quite young, remember back to high school, like you would have been romantically interested in the people around you, right? Like you're coming into contact day to day, so it's not that you're not interested necessarily in somebody else because of their background, but you don't come into contact with them. So things like friendship and romantic relationships, which from your question, thinks about this degree of intimacy, of closeness, um, are much lower in the areas that are separate, in part because they're not having contact, and in part getting at this question of the families wouldn't be terribly supportive of that, right? So if you come home, there's names from the two sides that would be quite uh, emblematic, right? And so let's say Aoife is a very Catholic name. So if I was a Protestant young man and I came home and said, oh, mom, this is my girlfriend Aoife, that probably wouldn't go over very well in certain communities. And so there's a lot of... Uh, uh, social sanctioning against that type of intimate contact. Um, but I think the hope of this shared education initiative is that first let's have contact. Let's improve attitudes. And then if they have opportunities for good quality contact, we can start to see things like friendship and these more intimate, like literally not saying, oh, we hope they date, but we can start to have closer relationships as well, which we know are actually what people want when we say contact. Like we don't just want people to sit next to each other, we want them to talk and share and be open. And the, the goal is for these shared education initiatives to, to, um, to uh, support that in the long run. That's a great question. Um, so <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll share one or two 
uh, empirical, so kind of research-based studies based on that work in Northern Ireland, and then I'll shift to the Balkans, okay? So this is, um, if anyone's interested, we can always share the papers, but it's a bit boring, so I put up pictures. Uh, okay, so when pro-social behaviors are helping acts, so those are acts basically to improve the well-being of others without getting something back. So if your teacher says you have to come to this event and you get points, that's different than if your teacher says there's this great event, right? So you don't get anything for doing a good act. That's what we mean when we say pro-social behaviors. And in the research on political violence, there's two trends. One set of research says if kids are exposed to political violence, let's see, they're, they're down more pro-social and it comes from those contexts, okay? So even though I've been exposed to adversity, I'm more likely to help. I'm more likely to do good things because of that adversity. The other half of the studies find the opposite effect. So when I'm exposed to political violence, to this intergroup threat to sectarianism, that dampens or decreases how pro-social I am, how helping, how um, kind or empathetic, okay? So what, kind of my research does, along with our colleagues, but broadly, tries to tease out why do we get these two different types of findings. So one is the timing of exposure. So when are kids exposed to political violence? So are they exposed to political violence? And then we go and measure them like 10 years later. Are they exposed to political violence? And we measure them within that same year, for example. Or how old are they? That's the next one. So um, we know that these kinds of things change with age. And so what we want to get at sense is some of these are comparing, you know, five to seven year olds, and some of these are comparing 18 to 25 year olds. And we think that pro-social behaviors might be very different for these young kids who have like very strict norms of fairness and older people who have more complex ways of understanding social justice and helping. The type of pro-social mat behavior matters. So uh, is it um, kind of helping? Is it uh, donating money, volunteering your time? working for a political group, right? Like, so there's lots of different ways to do these good acts, but the literature kind of collapses across that. And finally, the target. So who am I helping? Am I helping an in-group member or am I helping an out-group member? And very few studies explicitly manipulate that part. They just, the early research, they just, they said like, how pro-social are you? And they don't get it to whom are you being pro-social? Who are you helping? Who are you, like, which groups are you volunteering with? Which political parties do you support, right? So, so broadly, the line of work I do kind of teases all these issues out. I'll talk about one study, and then we'll move on to our work. Are there any questions about this before? No, it's kind of basic fact. Okay, so a specific type of pro-social behavior that teens and adolescents up into emerging adults like your guys' age start to do is something called civic engagement. So we break down civic engagement, um, we kind of define it as, well, this, inhaling the greater good, but it can be both political or social, okay? So it could be something like volunteering to help your local community, but it could also be something like boycotting a certain product. And by boycotting, if that, meaning you're purposely like not buying um, something produced, at, like in a historic example in South Africa during apartheid, the global community decided not to buy products from there because they didn't want to support that government, right? So it's explicitly kind of using economic political power in an intentional way, right? So that would be considered um, civic engagement as well. Wow, okay. <laughs> so there's a good set of global uh, studies that look at what civic engagement looks like across the world. Those are some ways to find it and happy to, if like you're interested in that kind of agency and young people being activists and for change for good, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, and then some works, uh, some colleagues that we work with in Croatia also did some studies um, that looked at the civic engagement in young people after, explicitly after political conflict, knowing that it might be different than just comparing it in uh, a non-divided uh, society. So this is a paper, and I'll walk you through what this image is saying. But basically, in our study, we talked to moms 
and kids in Belfast in those interfaced areas, right? So a Catholic living kind of in a separate neighborhood, but that is bordering a Protestant neighborhood. And we talked to them every year for six years, the same moms and the same teens. So we're able to kind of track each individual over time and see how he or she is changing, which is like super fancy in psychology, but it like looks like this at the end. Um, so basically we start with kids at different ages. So overall they cover a period of age 10 to 20, right? So they start right before their teen years and they end as emerging adults. And this is the amount of pro-social behaviors. And we used a very generic measure. So it's how uh, kind are you, how much you help others, how empathetic are you. And we used mom report of this for their kids. So an advantage is if you ask some people some questions and other people others, you're not just getting the same answers because you ask the same person. Okay, so it has this benefit that we have multiple reporters. And um, what we find is that over time, kids stay fairly flat, fairly consistent between like, let's say 10 and 15. They're very pro-social, but something happens around 15 or 16 and all of a sudden that starts to decrease, right? So we think, okay, pro-social behaviors change with age. We can, we can see that here, but it changes differently based on how exposed to sectarianism you are, right? So we have one group that's exposed to a lot of sectarianism, the intergroup threat, one group that's exposed to not so much, and they, their decrease happens at a different rate, right? So they, they change differently. And here we see those exposed to more sectarianism, so more intergroup threat, they, they decrease more sharply, like it's a faster decline, and they end up even lower. Whereas those exposed to less, they still go down, but not as quickly and not as deeply, right? So the implications are, if we can protect people from exposure to sectarianism, they will stay more pro-social for longer, okay? That's the take home message. And then what we were able to do with this when we think about the type of pro-social behavior is, um, these ones were very generic, right? Like I help, da 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 but we know, again, at a later age, kids are more likely to be engaged in civic engagement, right? We're not expecting our five-year-olds to go out and like start protesting, but it's not surprising that a 20-year-old might. So what we found is this, that these changes or the trajectories of pro-social behavior are linked to their later social and political engagement, right? So this kind of general, am I a nice person, actually has implications for do I do good in the world? Do I then go out and help society around me? So if you think about kind of something that is interpersonal, all of a sudden starts to have a societal implication because you're actually working to change the greater good, not just be nice to those around you. Okay, so we're trying to link across those levels. So again, these are the findings that I just said, but in words, right? So it's initial kind of plateau or shallow decrease that accelerates after 15. That de acceleration of that decrease is faster if you're exposed to violence than if you're not exposed to violence. And not terribly surprising, girls are higher in pro-social than boys, which is just, a, we find that across the literature, so that's not a, a big uh, point. So when we think about what's the intervention implications, we wanna catch these kids before the decline, right? Like if they're plateauing all of a sudden at this sharp point, we know, okay, intervention-wise, let's go the year before, let's prevent that decline, okay? So we wanna intervene with kids the way our schooling system is in the North, is they are declining around 15 because they leave school around 16. So like right then often in these high risk neighborhoods, they're no longer attending school, so they're no longer kind of accessing some of those social networks that help them be volunteers. So we wanna work particularly with kids who are leaving school. And we wanna target youth or those living in communities that have higher sectarianism, higher intergroup antisocial behaviors, right? Because we know that it decreases faster for them. Okay, so what's important about this is that, again, we see different types of social beha pro pro-social behavior, we see changes with age, and we also see this link to their exposure to sectarianism. So this paper tries to kind of answer some of those blue issues that were there in the previous literature. And in particular, as I mentioned, in this particular context, where kids are leaving school, we need to find other ways to reach them, to convene them those social networks so they continue to kind of change the social good, even if they are changing in their own uh, helping acts. Okay, are there any questions about that or if not, I'll shift gears. Yeah, okay. So actually, 
to be more efficient, I'm going to do it this way. Okay, so this is some of the work, as uh, um, Adona mentioned, we have this lab we call Helping Kids. It tends to be focused on what I call the littles, so they're like 5 to 11 versus what my last study, which is the bigs, 10 to 20. So um, we've written a paper together um, with other colleagues in Northern Ireland that can't be here that starts to kind of tease out um, some of these acts for the littles, like pro-social behaviors, and we'll talk a little bit about the findings across context as well. So kind of I'll invite you to think about whether um, this applies to where you're from or where you study or other cases that you know as well. And then we can have a general Q&A at the end. <clears throat> so in particular, we started to get interested in, like at a certain age, you know where someone's from, right? Whether it's accent, looking, or whatever. And how do kids know that? When do they learn that? And how do they learn that? So getting at this question, is it the school? Is it the family, et cetera? And in particular, because in Northern Ireland, they're the same ethnicity. They're all white, <laughs> right? And there's no other visual distinction kind of based on typical markers that you would use maybe in other intergroup contexts. So they speak the same language. The accent is the same. They eat the same foods, et cetera. So kind of how do kids know you're a Catholic, you're a Protestant, at what age do they learn that? That's where we started out kind of with this because we wanted to know once they learn that group, does that change their behaviors and their attitudes, okay? So again, when these things, uh, so when the two groups are not highly visible, typically like if we think about like race, then symbols start to be really important, right? What symbols you put on your body, what, how you dress, kind of where you live, all of a sudden those become markers for your group background, and importantly, how you tell what somebody else is, right? Um, and so um, the other kind of argument we make to start this is that these are five to 11 year olds, right? They're littles. So we're not necessarily gonna say they're at the forefront of the peace movement, but we're gonna try to look at behaviors that they do that could have long-term implications for peace building in this context, okay? And so what we talk about these is antecedents for peace building. And in particular, we're gonna look at giving behavior. So how likely they are to share valuable resources. And in our case, these are like really nice stickers that like little kids tend to love. And the idea is that like, you know, when you think about the governments deciding this school gets this money, that school gets that money, often in conflict settings, there's like a zero sum mentality, right? If the other side gets something, we are not getting it, right? And so there's a similar kind of limited idea that these resources of stickers are limited, how the kids distribute them, could have long-term implications for how they decide to distribute other valuable resources as they age. Okay, so that's kind of the, the argument of where we start with this line of research of helping kids. So you might start to recognize things now. Um, we worked uh, last year doing a ton of data collection with Adona, an amazing team of students from here um, and other colleagues, um, both in Kosovo and then now in North Macedonia as well. I'm also with an amazing team who I got to visit last year. Um, and you can see we had about 200 kids in each of those uh, settings. So we did research in Northern Ireland and in Kosovo and Macedonia, and our kids were roughly the same age, of course, because kids here start school a year later, we start at six. So the idea was really like, how does the school environment, going to a school where ethnicity is the majority, how does that matter for when these kids learn these symbols, okay? And I'll show you, this is the valuable resource task, right? So this is one of RAs in Northern Ireland, and we would show kids pictures like this. So this is, let's say, a green shirt would be, green is a color for Catholics, in case you didn't know. Um, so green, this would be like Aoife over here, and Elizabeth is a very Protestant name. Orange would be associated with the Protestant community. And what we would do is just obviously switch the t-shirts, right? So, you know, kids are seeing the same faces, but they're representing the other groups because you can't actually tell by looking at someone. and so. From a research perspective, that gives us a nice little advantage. And then we ask the kids, okay, how many stickers do you want to give to Aoife and Elizabeth? And they would distribute them accordingly, right? So that's the basic task, the games. We play a lot of other games, but that's the one I'll talk about today. And then we show them also a series of symbols. So I'll use examples from Northern Ireland, and I'm happy to talk about and have my colleagues share the symbols that they used. Um, but we show like the same picture of a street. And as I mentioned, the two sides will often use murals and other ways to depict those territories. So like this would be the three colors associated with Ireland or the tricolor flag. These are the three colors associated with Britain or the UK flag. Irish, 
uh, shamrock poppy is uh, for Remembrance Day in the UK. Whether Which kind of football team do you like? Do you like the Ireland football team or the Northern Ireland football team? And then also these murals that are part of the two communities. And so we ask kids uh, lots of different questions. So one would be, which do you like better? Which represents you better? You know, so different ways to get at, do they understand what these symbols mean and at what age? Okay. So what we found in, again, using like a nice fancy model, but we'll do it in pictures, is that as kids age, so when they go from five to 11, or in the case of here, six to 11, their preference for their own group symbol, right? So if you go to a Catholic school and you ask a parent who says, yes, my kid's Catholic, and the kid says, I like the shamrock better, that's a preference for in-group symbols, right? I like the tricolor better. I like the street with those colors better. That's what we're saying. So as kids age, they prefer their own symbol. So they prefer the markers from their community. And then this little negative sign means then when we ask them to do the sticker task, they give fewer stickers to the out group, right? So if I'm Catholic, I say, I like the shamrock. I give fewer stickers to Elizabeth, to the Protestant kid at the end of the study. Okay, so what this is saying is kind of with age, that shifts my own preferences for my group. And those preferences, those attitudes, do affect my behaviors. We found that similar model holding. So with age, more in-group preference, that preference leads to less out-group pro-social behavior, that less giving here in Kosovo. But in Macedonia, we didn't find this. We see this part, but we don't see this part. So part of the reason we do cross-cultural work is to try to tease out theoretically, like what is it is case-specific? How are the schools organized? What communities that we'd work with? And what is maybe more universal, kind of more about child's age or cognition or the way they're socialized. So we get this benefit of being able to kind of compare and contrast across settings through this helping kids work. So again, and what we're interested in um, is these overall kind of teasing apart different types of pro-social behavior, looking at them in context where there has been a history of intergroup tension and there are lingering kind of social divisions that we know kids are being raised in these. And so how does that affect their outgroup giving behaviors or outgroup pro-social behaviors? So with that, I think there's like still maybe 10 minutes for question and answer. If there's other things that folks want to know about, happy to chat about that. Or if it's specifically about our two contexts, I'm going to call on my colleagues to help as well. Um, but don't have any questions either about the kind of the fancy model from Northern Ireland or kind of the general line of research that we're doing with helping kids? Can you see any similarities to places that you've lived or worked or studied? Mm -hmm. And why do you think that was? I And it's certainly, whether it's imposed intentionally, that's a great point, and thank you for responding. So whether it's imposed, what we would say, it's kind of, is this intentional or indirect, right? So where you live may or may not be intentional, right? You might have lived in a certain place, and that's where your family lived. There's close social bonds. They might not have chosen that neighborhood explicitly because it's homogenous or only one in-group. But it's contextual, right? So it might be indirect, like you were saying. You don't have that much contact in an incidental way with people from a different background. And one of the things that we know really matters from literature, again, not in this project, but really broad, is that the more diverse a neighborhood is, so residential diversity is one of the primary predictors of intergroup attitudes, behaviors, and kind of more intimate forms of contact, right? Because you kind of have to come into contact, share food, shop in the same place, share social activities in order to then 
decide that you want to spend your life with that person, right? And then maybe even raise kids together. Um, so that is certainly something that matters. And I think the other kind of thing that comes with that is um, something that one of our colleagues at Queens has looked at is um, kind of anxiety. So apprehension, right? If you're raised in a certain environment, you speak a certain language, you eat certain foods, if you are provided the opportunity to go to another community to start to interact with people from a different background, different language, different cultural traditions, that may have an impact on your level of comfort or confidence in those contact encounters. So again, one of our colleagues, Rhiannon Turner, looks at kind of, even if kids haven't had contact, how confident are they are if you were to put them in that situation that they could kind of take advantage of it in the way that we all kind of hope and aspire to when we create these, these settings where kids can have shared spaces. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, mm. No, it's a fabulous point. And actually, people in Northern Ireland anecdotally say the exact same thing, right? So if you were in Belfast, the city, like you wouldn't necessarily mix. But if you found yourself in a pub in Spain on holiday, and you hear the accent from Northern Ireland is very distinct. And if you hear that, you're like, oh, hello, man, hello. And they like get on. But if you went back home, you then wouldn't cross over to talk with each other, right? So that's a totally kind of comparable anecdote for things that I, I've been told by friends and colleagues. Um, and then your other kind of more substantial point, which we looked at as well, is um, there's certainly like national identity, right? So <clears throat> in the case of Northern Ireland, that would be whether you identify as being British or Irish. And in fact, as a result of the peace process, people in Northern Ireland, so that we part at the top, can choose to have an Irish passport. They don't have to have a UK passport, right? So they're in the nation of the UK, living on UK territory, but they have an Irish and only an Irish passport, right? That's a really unusual but creative situation. And so we ask kids about this difference between their national identification, being Irish or British, as well as kind of the more kind of local term, which would be kind of Catholic or Protestant. And we see that that national emerges earlier. So our five and six year olds, if you say, is this, flag British or Irish, they can sort that earlier than you say, is this flag Catholic or Protestant? So we are finding some of those national kind of versus community differences, even with these young kids. Um, so that's a great point. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think to be I was going to ask that. Uh, so I know this is this year, yeah, we have a community of this person that is very much uh, conflict. And uh, now that we've actually sort of decided to work with the other products, we're going to sort of, yeah. Uh, before that, people would buy the products of sort of, yeah. And I don't think that it's a serious problem. But now it has become uh, also like the awareness of the things not like that. Mm. Now see it as a good thing for me. I personally do that. I, I work with this society and I see it as a good thing not to buy products mm. in Serbia. That's a fabulous example, right? So it's saying, okay, as a nation, there might be a law, but then to what degree do individuals, young people who are bright and educated, do you kind of support th those national kind of uh, tendencies or what kind of other social movements are there? And that reminded me because last night, so we just got in last night and uh, we went to the shop and I had never seen like um, every product, not every, most products had a flag next to it. Actually, we were talking about like, so it actually did, your thought was like, is that because they don't want you to buy Serbian products? I hadn't thought about that. That's all right, okay. 
Right. Because so in Ireland, so the Republic, the other nation, people are like so pro-Irish. It's like, so when you check out at the shop, next to any product that was made in Ireland, there's a, there's a shamrock. So you kind of know at the end, okay, I ticked, I got 50% of my like product, like milk and eggs from Ireland. Now it's also an island. So there's a reason why you would buy local as well. It's usually cheaper. But so we were talking last night, honestly, about like, okay, actually my... This is going to be too much. We chose like beers from every nation we could get and then started to compare them. <laughs> we're wild. Um, but we were thinking about other products like that. So it's really interesting to, to think that that's kind of, we were just noticing it, but that's, um, that's not something else to be thinking about for our own research as well. And that could be done with an, like an adult population. <laughs> and there was a question. Did you have a? Uh, no, it's all right. Yeah. Sorry, no. I have a all right okay so this particular study there wasn't so it's a bit complicated because we've run like i don't know 15 different series of experiments so in what i just showed you it wasn't it was forced choice you could choose this or that in a different study, we did what's called an open sorting task. So we said, okay, here's two boxes. This is labeled Catholic, this is labeled Protestant. Here's a whole bunch of pictures. Sort them the way you want. So kids could leave images out. Like they didn't have to put, they didn't have to make that choice. And we found the exact same pattern, even with the open sorting in Northern Ireland that we did with the for forced choice. So, you know, again, because we're social scientists, that's a great question. We tried to kind of ask the question different ways to see does the way we ask the question influence. Yeah, so in the control group, uh, our colleague Jocelyn, what we do is we introduce what's called a novel category. So we say, this is IFA, or sorry, this is a Protestant, this is a Catholic, this is a flerp. Like, flerp isn't a word that exists, even in English, if some of you are wondering, like, what did she just say? And then we say, or this is a zaz. Again, a word that's made up. And so we ask, do you like, the Catholic or Protestant better? Do you like the flerp or zazz better, right? So even if kids are just by chance making those choices, that's what we use as our control in this other study. So we these made up social categories um, to compare. And then we also use gender. So we know that gender is the first and the earliest social category to emerge for young kids. With some exceptions, people finding accent comes out really early. Um, but we say like, this is, <laughs> this is a boy and this is a girl, which they already know. And so we see they're giving to boys and girls compared to their giving to Catholic and Protestant, compared to their giving to Flerp and Zaz, and it goes gender, Catholic, Flerp and Zaz. So it is different than a made up category, but not as strong as gender. Girls giving to girls and boys giving to boys. But great question, very like, are you a psychologist? All right, okay, well you're welcome to the team then. All right, so this little thing here, is your confidence interval, CI, so it's a 95% confidence interval for the nerds in the classroom. It's uh, just, it's barely significant. Like if you see like that, like it's just on this side of zero, but, um, and same with this one actually, it's the exact same for those two. Um, yeah, but we had the power to detect a small effect and that's what we're finding basically. Yeah. Ah, oh, right, okay, I totally skipped over that. Okay, so in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, where we work, um, there's kind of, you think of it like a two by two grid, right? So uh, interfaced, non-interfaced, low SES, or low socioeconomic status, higher. There are no communities that are interfaced and rich, right? Because if you're interfaced, it's high violence, socially marginalized, no one wants, mm, it's hard to sell a house there, okay. let's put it that way. Not that you don't wanna live there, but if you wanted to leave, you're not gonna find somebody else actively coming in. So what we do in Northern Ireland is we say, okay, there's interface and not interface so we take only those that are lower SES schools, and we match them based on free school meals. So that's the percentage of kids that have access to lunch because their families can't afford it. So we're in that way we're comparing apples to apples, but only for lower, SES kids because we can't really sample from the other box. Some of our previous work looked at interface and non-interface across social class as well, but then you're kind of getting that as a confound. 
And I forget what we did here. I think for here, we weren't able to do that just based on like the way the communities, yeah, like the way the schools are organized doesn't provide quite such a neat um, quasi-experimental design. Good question, yeah. Yes, and then I will pass it over to Adona. No, I'm gone. I just want to know what Okay, so here, of course, we, we looked at signals that make more sense for the complex. So, for example, we had kids comparing whether they want to choose their ethnic, Albanian, or Serb flag. So, we had Albanians and Serbs, interested in the Tunisia. And then we had them ask, okay, do you want to do you prefer your ethnic flag or do you prefer, let's say, a Kosovo flag? Mm. And then in another set, we asked them whether they prefer their ethnic flag versus what we designed as an integrated ethnic and Kosovo flag to see whether there is a difference in that. And of course, we find that you might expect that children show high preferences for their own ethnic flags, among the other uh, symbols and markers mm. that were used, like food, for example, Clea for Albanians and Sadr mm. for the Serbs. Uh, we looked at statues like mm. uh, scandal based statues versus the Welsh Obelich for Serbs. Uh, we looked at uh, yeah, traditional clothing wear, so children wearing traditional clothes in Albania with kids in one of those versus uh, the Serbian ones and, and so on and so forth. But uh, basically, uh, what we find is, well, among the other things, is this that the more they prefer the uh, symbols, the, the less they give to. So, for example, for an Albanian kid, the more they, they show them the, the, the symbols of their own group, the less they will produce the girls out to the serve uh, children. And, and vice versa. We have a nice, I was about to say that towards the end, but just if you're interested, we can about that. Mm. The Kosovo specific study. We just uh, wrote an article that was out just the day before independence of Christina Insight. It's called the, uh, the Public that they buy, and it gives a bit more insight in terms of the Kosovo specific. Uh, mm. And, and I think just to kind of to build on Adonis, so if you weren't able to hear, there's lots of different symbols. And roughly, we tried to kind of get at this question of, is it national? Is it political? Like, where do the identity lines fall out? Is it because you are part of a religious community? So in general, we tried to pick symbols that were maybe political in nature. So political leaders or statues, things that are more cultural, so food or certain ethnic dress. Often we put sport in the cultural idea, so which kind of national team did you support? And then we also chose religious symbols, right? There would be maybe a mosque or other types of things that would be more traditionally kind of associated with religion. And we know those are overlapping categories, right? They're not perfect, but we tried to see, okay, maybe kids identify all the religion stuff really early and all the politics comes later or maybe it's all cultural early. So we're still doing, we haven't done those analyses, but we do hope to see, okay, you know, which types of symbols are more salient for kids at what ages? So that's a good question as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so anyway, so again, um, thank you so much for Dona and various colleagues here at RIT for hosting us and to the Helping Kids Lab for two years of work that kind of leads to some of these fun games and kind of problematic studies with intervention implications. And again, thank you so much for your questions. It's so nice to be engaged with students even on a Friday when you don't have to be here. So thank you very much for your time as well. <laughs>